Hey folks, George here again. Today we're going to talk about another work of Japanese literature. This time we'll discuss the short story Patriotism by Mishima Yukio. I'm going to give a quick uh, disclaimer right here at the beginning. Mishima is my favorite Japanese writer. Uh, I love his works. I think his craftsmanship is uh, amazing. And I believe that uh, so many of the themes that he examines are quite amazing. However, I've got this uh, odd relationship with Mishima because Mishima's politics are quite a bit different from my own politics. We'll discuss that quite a bit uh, later, I think. And how do we engage with works of art, whether it's music? Uh, if in music, I love Reichard Wagner and his ring cycle. However, Reichard Wagner had a very odd um, political view, worldview. How do we engage with works of art by artists who have um, eccentric political views? I think eccentric is a nice way to put it. Uh, some people would be uh, so unkind as to call Mishima an ultra-nationalist or a far-right wing uh, figure. How can I, George, uh, reconcile my love for Mishima the writer with Mishima's odd political or rather uh, political values that are at, are at odds with my own political values? We'll, we'll see today. Uh, as always, we'll talk about uh, the four story elements, characters, setting, plot, and themes. We'll also talk about sorts of connections like uh, the text and the structure of the text itself, intertextual connections, historical connections, and of course my own connections to self. Uh, I've already revealed a little bit about myself here by saying that Mishima is my favorite Japanese writer, probably one of my favorite writers. First let's talk about the characters in patriotism. The characters, there's really only two characters, or are there? Let's see what happens here. We've got Lieutenant Takayama, who's a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Army. And he's called, of course, to stop a mutiny, that a real mutiny that happened in history called the February 26th incident. We've also got his wife, Reiko, who's his very loyal and devoted wife, ultimately goes and follows him all the way to death, all the way to the suicide that we see in this story. What is interesting about Lieutenant Takayama? Well, number one is, he ultimately decides that he cannot, and he acknowledges as such, he cannot attack his fellow soldiers in the name of the Imperial Army. And as such, he commits suicide. And he commits a very ritualistic seppuku suicide that we'll discuss a bit here. And of course, Reiko, being an ideal wife, at least that's how Mishima paints her, uh, follows him into death by committing suicide herself after he kills himself. There's a third character that I want to discuss, though, whom I frequently like to discuss when I discuss uh, short stories or novels or things like this, and that is the narrator. The narrator is a very interesting character because while the narrator is telling us a story, the narrator so frequently gives us her own position here. And it's a quite an interesting position. The narrator constantly calls uh, Takayama and his wife Reiko heroes and ideals that make the divine gods weep at their wonderful actions. Here's a question, though. Is the narrator Mishima, the author, are they the same? Are they the same? That's going to be a question that you're going to have to ask yourself. It's very easy and very, uh, on the surface, very simple to say, of course, Mishima, the author, is the narrator. And especially when we know about Mishima's own political views and Mishima's own history, it so turns out that in 1970, 10 years after this story was published, Mishima himself commits suicide in the ritualistic seppuku manner that the characters in this novel or that in this short story do. And furthermore, Mishima writes several other works of literature. Uh, one that I really love is Runaway Horses, um, where 
the lead character commits seppuku. And not only that, in Runaway Horses, um, he is very much, the protagonist is very much a right-wing political uh, advocate and trying to strive back to uh, traditional samurai values, samurai and Buddhist values. So on the surface, it seems like, of course, Mishima, the author, is the same as the narrator. Because after all, they both value and hold high this beautiful or this uh, very uh, loyal and honorable seppuku action, especially in the name of the country, Japan. But I wonder, but I wonder, after all, Mishima's dead. We can't ask him. I wonder how Mishima really feels about all of this. And there are little hints in the text that I'm going to try to focus upon to try to address, wait, how does the author feel about what's happening in here? About their suicide? How does the author feel about the narrator who is uh, glorifying their suicide? Now, obviously, it's going to be very hard to disentangle the two. So everything I'm saying is merely my interpretation. I, of course, welcome your interpretation too. Please, yeah, share with us what your interpretation is. Am I so off the wall? Maybe it's just my personal bias, my love for Mishima the writer that's trying to defend Mishima here and trying to illustrate how Mishima isn't as uh, politically right-wing and politically uh, really crazy as he pretended to be in real life. Also with the characters, here's a key question that I really like. Asking, I really like asking this question. Who is the protagonist? We've got Takayama and we've got Reiko. Who's the hero here? Is one above the other? I've got an odd interpretation to go with that here as well. So let's carry on and see what happens. Uh, clearly, Right at the beginning, and now we'll talk a little bit about the text, but also about the plot, because the plot is so simple in this story, right? Um, and it's a very interesting feature of the text and the structural elements of this text itself, such that Mishima in the very first page and the narrator give us the whole plot of the story, and they tell us exactly how this story is going to end. On the first page, he basically says, listen, Takayama... Lieutenant Takayama was called to stop the mutiny of the February 26th incident, but seeing as how he couldn't uh, stomach pitting Imperial soldier against Imperial soldier, he took the honorable route and killed himself. Okay, fine. And that's it. And his wife follows in suit. And that's all that happens in the story. That's all that happens in the story. Why is it that an author gives us everything at the beginning. After all, in the 21st century, I hear so many people online complaining, no, no, spoil alert. Don't tell me what happens at the end. Spoil alert. Well, Mishima has violated that uh, sentiment on the very first page by telling us exactly how this story is going to end. He spoils the story for us. What does that reveal regarding the text? Well, for me, I've always looked askance at people who say, don't spoil the story for me. After all, you could maybe tell from some of my uh, talks here that I don't really care about plot very much. I don't think plot is the most interesting element of any story, to be honest with you, of any real deep work of art. Why do I say such a ridiculous thing? Well, it so happens that I really subscribe to what uh, Joseph Campbell called the hero of a thousand faces. That we've all been telling the same story over and over again for eons. We already know the stories over and over again. There really isn't an original story. And there shouldn't be. And we should rec not only recognize that, but appreciate that. Then what is the task for the writer? It's to craft and write a beautiful text for us. How do you play this same riff if you're playing music? There's only so many chord progressions in traditional music. 
so many people, especially those of us who like popular music, harmonically, it's all the same. Harmonically, so much of music is the same, yet we still listen to it. Why? Because you want to see what different musicians do with the same old ideas. And same thing with writers here. We want to see what do amazing writers do with old plots. This reminds me of Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. What happens on the very first page of Romeo and Juliet? Shakespeare writes and tells the audience. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. What's going to happen in this story? By the way, how many of you don't know what happens in Romeo and Juliet? We all know what happens, yet we still go see the play. Yet we still appreciate the literature. We still read it, despite the fact that we know how these great works of literature end. It reminds me of a great song. How many times do you listen to the same song over and over and over and over again? What's my point here? Or watch the same movie over and over and over again. Because great movies, great stories, great music, it's not about the plot. It's rather how the artist the craftsman, craftsperson, has crafted the story. And even though you know what's coming next, the amazing writer can still entrance us and keep us reading. And that's what I love about this work of art. That's what I love about Mishima. That's what I love about Shakespeare. That's what I love about all the same movies that I watch over and over again. I know what's gonna happen next, yet you still watch. So that's my little diatribe, forgive me please, for, or rather against, all this attack against people who say, oh, don't spoil it for me. Spoil alert, no, don't spoil stories for me. Who cares? If you really love the craft, if you really love the art, what happens you being spoiled at the end is not going to stop you from reading a great work of literature. Isn't going to stop you from watching a great movie and re-watching a great movie. Nor is it going to stop us from listening to great music, despite the fact that we know what happens. And Mishima proves this in this text, at least from my perspective, because I've read this text many, many, many times. Every time I cry at the same parts. So that's one interesting thing about the textual structure of this work, is that he tells us the plot at the very beginning. So I don't want to talk too much more about plot then, yeah? Let's talk about setting. What is interesting about the setting of this work? The setting is only one place. One place. And that's in their home. The setting never ventures out, despite the fact that the lieutenant leaves the home to address the mutiny, to quell the mutiny when he's called by his superior officers. We don't follow Takayama outside of the home. Rather, when he's gone, we stay with Reiko. Why is that interesting? Because it seems to me that Mishima is suggesting that this home is a very sacred place. As a matter of fact, I love, on page 11, leaping at once from his bed and without speaking a word, the lieutenant donned his uniform, buckled on the sword, held ready for him by his wife, and hurried swiftly out into the snow-covered streets of the still-darkened morning. He did not return until the evening of the 28th. We see him leave, and yet he doesn't come back until page 16, and that means for all those pages in between, we stay with Reiko. We stay with Reiko the whole time. 
As they're preparing after he's returned and they've decided we will commit suicide because I cannot kill my fellow soldier. Look at page 36 and on page 36 we get the gravity of why Mishima, the writer, has chosen to focus solely in the home. At the top of 36, even the noises of the trains and streetcars around Yotsuya Station did not penetrate this far. Why am I focusing on that? Because it's important to Mishima that he has put the setting in such a place that is separated from the rest of Japan. Why does he want to do that? The noise of the streetcars. It's interesting that he chooses to talk about streetcars and trains. Well, for one thing, and we haven't talked about this just yet, we are talking about the historical context, and of course this is going to inform a lot of Mishima's politics in himself. Isn't that distancing, in my interpretation, isn't that distancing the Reiko and Takayama characters? Isn't that distancing them from modern Japan? Noise cannot penetrate into their house. The noise of modern trains and streetcars. Remember this uh, February 26th incident. And we'll talk about this in a moment. But this February 26th incident happened in 1936, where Japan was at a very uh, interesting crossroads. So it's interesting that Mishima says, look, this home is sacred. Everything outside of this home is crazy and dirty and noisy. But throughout the text, throughout this story, we read about how orderly their home is, how clean their home is, how beautiful their home is. And doesn't that separate it from outside? Their home is this sacred place. And Mishima's language and descriptions really painted as such. Why would he want to do that? Call inside the home. Well, he does want to contrast orderly, clean, beautiful, with ugly, uh, dirty, and disorderly, chaotic, really. And that's going to be a very interesting theme. Those are some of the themes, at least, that he's discussing throughout the text. Beauty versus ugly, orderliness versus disorderliness. Right? Uh, uh, clean versus dirty, chaos on this side, and organization on this side. We'll see how he uses those competing themes later on, because I think it's awesome, actually. And it really helps me, in my interpretation, uh, my very uh, unorthodox and unconventional interpretation of Mishima in this text. What else can be said about the setting of this story? Well, I've already described, and this goes along with the history, right? Setting and history are going to be very uh, closely intertwined with this text, but he's chosen to write a work of historical fiction. What is historical fiction? Historical fiction being that he takes a real historical event, in this case, the February 26th incident, and crafts a story around it. The question is going to rise. Why write about the February 26th incident? What is the February 26th incident? Well, let's give a little bit of a historical background right here. The February 26th incident was one in which a group of mutineers tried to take over uh, the Japanese military because they felt like the Japanese military was becoming weak. And they wanted the Japanese military to become strong and uh, we could say expansionary for that matter. And of course, uh, these mutineers were defeated. However, were they defeated? After all, following 1936, Japan did embark on terrible uh, expansionary and imperialistic program. The Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937 instigated Japan going to war against the Chinese uh, Republic and Sh under Chiang Kai-shek. And many people consider that to be the uh, uh, beginning of World War II in the Pacific, or Japan's participation in what we today call World War II. And this is an interesting thing. Clearly, these mutineers of the February 26th incident, although they individually 
or defeated. Their spirit carried on, and Japan embarks on even more expansionary progress that had started certainly uh, uh, even in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, with modernization. Another question that I hope arises here is, why does anybody write about historical fiction? Why would Mishima choose to revolve uh, his story around that incident? Well, one person might say, well, obviously, Mishima is a right-wing nationalist, far right-wing nationalist, and of course he looked at the mutineers of that event with awe and with admiration. And I think that's the popular uh, sentiment, right? And I'm not sure I entirely disagree with that, uh, but I think it's probably going to be a little bit more complicated than that at the same time. The public and the popular persona that Mishima portrays is one in which, you know, he values far right wing uh, values, he values strengthening Japan, and he values uh, a, a more strong Japanese military. How can we make sense of this? How could George try to defend that? Because after all, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I don't like far right wing politics, I don't like ultra nationalism. So, how can I defend this? Well, I think we can defend this in a way that understands the context of 1960s Japan, when Mishima actually wrote this work. So let's go to the history a little bit. So let's talk about the 1960s in Japan a little bit, and the lead up, what Mishima's life was like in 1960s. This is clearly after World War II, World War II having ended in 1945, right? And what happens at the end of World War II? Well, America, for the first time in Japanese history, and Japan had never been conquered before, yet in 1945, for the first time in history, Japan was controlled by an occupying army, the Americans. What does that mean? Well, if you also know your uh, post-World War II history, what else happens after World War II? Well, the Cold War. And really the Cold War, uh, quick uh, reminder here, is really... This war between this Cold War between the United States and the USSR, the Soviet Union, capitalism on one side and liberal democracy on the other side, uh, on one side, and on the side of the Soviet Union, a communist democracy, right? And which one is going to win over? It so happens that America had a big uh, stake in spreading their vision of the world over the world, and by the way, the USSR did just the same. Look at all of Eastern Europe, for example, even into China and Korea, Central and South America as well. These are all fronts for the Cold War. However, one interesting front is Japan. And America wanted to keep Japan on the American side of this Cold War against communism. And how did they do that? Well, it so happens that there were many military bases that were established, American military bases that were established throughout Japan, number one, that are still there. They're still a big source of controversy on both sides of the political divide, right and left. And that's what's interesting here. It's easy to call Mishima a right-wing uh, nationalist here, but people on the left were just as critical of this American, this overt, American influence on Japanese politics and the Japanese system. How might Japanese people want to respond to that? Well, it so happens furthermore that Japan made a miraculous recovery after World War II, primarily because of the aid that the United States fed into Japan. Right? Now, one of those way, ways of economic aid is military aid. What do I mean by that? Well, Japan written into the Japanese constitution, by the way, written by Americans, the current Japanese constitution written by Americans, is still that same constitution that was written by Americans after World War II, says and outlaws a Japanese military. Well, how is a country supposed to defend itself without a military? Well, this is a debate that's still raging today in Japan. But how did they do it uh, in the immediate aftermath of World War II? America supplied the military, and America protected Japan. And, by the way, that protection afforded Japan to, instead of expending a lot of resources uh, into military, they rebuilt and redirected it into the consumer economy. 
And that is a big reason why the Japanese economic miracle was so successful. Because so much of uh, the typical expenditures were taken care of by the American military, namely that Japan didn't have to pay for a military. There's this American-Japan security treaty such that Japan can count on America for defense. Now, what does that mean, though? Doesn't that entail that Japan isn't its own country? That Japan doesn't really have sovereignty over itself? And so there's a lot of protests in Japan, both on the right and on the left, that are both agreeing. This is what's interesting, that both the right and the left agree that America should get the heck out of Japan, or at least Japan should be its a more independent nation. Shouldn't it? That's a hard uh, debate to engage with right now, but at least within this, and there's a lot of protests in the 60s and a huge counterculture in the 60s that is and centered around and at least uh, uh, influenced by this debate. How sovereign is Japan as a nation? And with all of that in mind now, I think I could have a little bit of more sympathy for somebody like Mishima who wants Japan to be a strong nation and to stand up for itself. Because it's fairly easy to claim and a very easy argument to make that Japan wasn't even a sovereign nation even after the Americans technically returned sovereignty over to Japan in 1952. So from 52 to 1960, Japan was technically a sovereign nation, except America had its hands in everything, especially the military. And if you can't defend yourself, are you really, do you really own yourself? And that's a big debate. And it's within that context that Mishima goes on the far right direction and says we need to be more like a, a strong nation that we were prior to World War II. People on the left are going to say, well, we need to be a little bit more uh, welcoming to communist influence, both from the Soviet Union and uh, China. But that's why people like me are going to be a little bit more sympathetic and a little bit more forgiving at Mishima, because he's trying to fight this battle for at least sovereignty of his own country. And aren't there people today in America who are still talking about this sort of issue? I'm talking, of course, of the native peoples of America. How sovereign shall they be over their own destiny? This is discussions that are happening all over the world in 2020, as a matter of fact. Scotland frequently debates about how sovereign Scotland shall be from the United Kingdom, which is de facto England. In Spain, you have these sorts of debates. In China, we have these sorts of debates. Hong Kong is talking about these. How sovereign shall a people be? Now, I'm not going to answer these questions right now. This isn't the place to answer them, but I am only bringing up these debates so that we can better understand what 1960s Japan was like and why Mishima, who seems like a radical to me, might not have been so radical. When you put somebody in a radical country, in a radical world, radicalism is an appropriate response, perhaps. Right? And I have a little bit more sympathy for radical responses in a radical world. So that helps me understand a little bit about why Mishima might be wanting to harken back to this February 26th incident and write about this February 26th incident. Because after all, authors, even authors of historical fiction, are never writing about historical fiction. They're not writing about history. They're writing about right now. Mishima is not writing about 1936 Japan. He's writing about 1960 Japan. And that's what's interesting when we read historical fiction. How do we look at history from the lens of today? And we'll see how Mishima wrestles with these issues and these debates. Now we're going to delve a bit more into the themes that Mishima explores in this text. Now, what's easy is to talk about the themes right on their surface. Mishima throws right in your face so many interesting themes that are ripe for a great discussion. Number one, loyalty. What does loyalty really mean? Is Takayama, in not attacking his own uh, soldiers, is he loyal to his fellow soldiers? The title of the story, patriotism, 
uh, brings to mind nationalism and love of country. Is Takayama a patriot? Honor is discussed time and time again throughout this story. Not just honor, but the morality about all of this is through and through. Uh, I kind of see that Mishima is making this, or at least the narrator, excuse me, the narrator is discussing, and Takayama and Reiko herself too, are discussing this kind of equation between happiness and morality and patriotism, but also the body. The body is very important in this story. It is, after all, the body that acts and behaves. It's the body, it's this kind of thing that is patriotic. It's this kind of thing that loves a country. It's this kind of thing that is patriotic. It's this kind of thing that dies in ritual seppuku. It's this kind of thing that dies with suicide. And so we see Mishima so frequently talk about the body and the beauty of the body and the cleanliness of the body and the suffering that the body goes through. But I think that all of this is so much on the sleeve. Mishima wears these uh, themes right on the sleeve. So here's where I am going to go in a slightly unconventional direction here. It's clear that Takayama and Reiko and the narrator hold all of these sort of values in very high regard, right? What does the narrator, after all, say so many times in this? Uh, well, on page four, what does the narrator think? The day which for a soldier's wife had come has come. The last moments of this heroic and dedicated couple were such as to make the gods themselves weep. I love that poetry. I love the poetry that me, I mean, this is why I love Mishima. Furthermore, on page 42, what he was about to perform was an act in his public capacity as a soldier, something he had never previously shown his wife. It called for resolution equal to the courage to enter battle. It was a death of no less degree and quality than death in the front line. It was his conduct in the battlefield that he was now to display. So he clearly, the narrator, continuously is painting their actions with a very high moral estimation. On page 51, it would be difficult to imagine a more heroic sight than that of the lieutenant at this moment, as he mustered his strength and hung back his head. On page 27, the narrator also says, all around, vastly and untidily stretched the country for which he grieved. That goes back to my discussion of setting, remember? When I said that the house was clean and tidy. Here he says all around was the country which was untidy and vast. All around vastly and untidily stretched the country for which he grieved. He was to give his life for it. But would that great country with which he was prepared to remonstrate to the extent of destroying himself, take the slightest heed of his death. He did not know, and it did not matter. His was a battlefield without glory, a battlefield where none could display deeds of valor. It was the front line of the spirit. That line it just makes me fill with emotion. The front line of spirit, not the front line of a battle, with guns and bullets, but a front line of spirit and morality. The narrator clearly loves what they are doing right here. However, and this was my question at the beginning of the talk, how does Mishima feel, the author, about the narrator? How does Mishima feel about the characters Takayama and his wife Reiko? My hunch is there's another very fascinating element of the structural features of this text, and that is paradox. It seems to me that the narrator is all in on these moral values that we're talking about here. He's all in, the narrator is, with the seppuku that they will commit. However, it seems to me that there are paradoxes throughout this text that we have to pick up on. And what do the paradoxes reveal? Well, 
Let's look at the paradox first. It was the part that I just read right there on page 27. It was a country for which he grieved. He was to give his life for his country. But would that great country with which he was prepared to remonstrate to the extent of destroying himself take the slightest heed of his death? Where's the paradox in that? He loves his country. However, what is he doing? He is remonstrating his country. He is saying, you are doing wrong, country. He's criticizing his country. That seems to me an interesting paradox. To me, paradox is different from contradiction, right? It would be a contradiction to say uh, one plus one equals three. To me, that's a terrible contradiction. But it's not a paradox to say, I love my country and I am going to punish my country. He's punishing his country how? With his own death. And that seems quite paradoxical to me. What I mean is, it doesn't seem to make sense. If you grieve for the country, wouldn't you try to help it? He's not trying to help his country. He's killing himself. He's taking a way out from helping his country. Is he patriotic? He's called upon to punish the mutineers, his fellow soldiers. What would be the patriotic thing to do? Wouldn't it be to stop people who are trying to take over your country? These mutineers. Isn't that what patriotism entails? Yet he says, I will not listen to my country. When they call me to stop the mutineers, I will not do what, they, what my country asks of me. That seems quite paradoxical to me. Quite paradoxical. However, the greatest paradox happens on page 46. And this is where, uh, number one, it's the most disgusting element of this story, where the description of the seppuku act and all the bloodiness and goriness comes through. I'm not going to get too gory and too bloody here. Rather, I want to focus on the paradoxical nature of that blood and gore. Why is this just on the surface already so paradoxical? It seems to me that the whole first part of the text, up to page 46, is painting the characters with such beauty and courage. It's painting their house with such beauty and purity as distinct from outside. Yet what happens on page 46? He commits the act of seppuku. He stabs himself in the gut and he feels all of the pain. He knows he's going to die. He's already done it. He's not quite done with the deed yet, but he's in the middle of the deed. And this point of the text is the fulcrum by which the whole text in my interpretation revolves and moves. Okay, so I'll read a little bit of the blood and gore. Why not? It's fun, isn't it? He returned to consciousness. The blade had certainly pierced the walls of his stomach, he thought. His breathing was difficult. His chest thumped violently, and in some far deep region which he could hardly believe was a part of himself, a fearful and excruciating pain came welling up as if the ground had split open to disgorge a boiling stream of molten rock. The pain suddenly came nearer with terrifying speed. The lieutenant bit his lower lip and stilled an instinctive moan. And here's the moment of paradox. Here's the moment where the whole text flips upside down. Was this seppuku, he was thinking. Why do I focus on that question mark so much? Was this seppuku, he was thinking. What's so interesting about that question mark? It seems like the whole buildup of this text. He's ready to die. He was ready to die before he even knew what was happening, it seemed like. As a matter of fact, on my interpretation, it seems like the lieutenant, he just wants to die for his country, even before he knows what's happening. 
it's almost as though he fantasizes death and has this fantasy, this romantic fantasy about, I want to die for my country by any means. He's looking forward to dying for his country. And he's courageous throughout. And throughout, are you ready to die, wife? She says, yes, of course I'm ready. And yet here on page 46, what do we see? We see him dying for his country, so to speak. So he believes. So he thought. But it seems to me that if he was willing to die for his country in this way, that he would say instead of, was this seppuku? He would say, this is seppuku. Wouldn't he? I'm not much of an actor. You'll forgive me, I hope. But you stab in. Oh, oh, this is seppuku. Eh. Right? That looks like the glory that he's painting up to up until page 46. Instead, what happens? Instead, what happens? And this is where I feel like the narrator is different from the author. Instead, what happens? The author has Takayama question the whole thing. Instead of, this is seppuku, he stabs, he cuts. This Was this seppuku? And he doubts everything by asking that question. That question mark turns the whole earlier part of this text on its head. Would I love to even bring that point a bit further home at the top of page 47? It struck him as incredible that amidst this terrible agony, things which could be seen could still be seen, and existing things existed still. Now, why does that passage illustrate the paradox even more so? Well, it seems to me that he's quite foolish for being surprised that existing things are existing still. I'm sorry to break it to y'all. Well, I'll just speak for myself, I suppose. But when I die, I believe that the world will continue on existing, despite the fact that I die. It seems like Mishima, the writer here, is telling us that he's surprised that the world is going to go on without him. That Takayama is surprised. It struck him as incredible that existing things existed still. What's incredible about that? I feel it's Mishima, the writer, going against the narrator and saying, Takayama's a fool. He thought that once he commits seppuku, the world would stop. Clearly, that's not the case. And thus, we get this odd paradox. What I consider to be an odd paradox isn't Mishima, the author, painting Takayama as a fool? Is he really a hero for doing what he's doing? To be sure, the narrator paints him as a hero, all to the lead up, up to page 46. And then afterwards, he commits seppuku, and the world descends into chaos. I didn't finish reading that sentence on page 46. Let me continue. Was this seppuku, he was thinking. It was a sensation of utter chaos. Recall previously, the chaos was outside the house. Now with this seppuku act, he's the chaos. He's the chaotic one. It's not the rest of Japan that's chaotic. Or at least, it's not only Japan that's chaotic. But he has joined in on this chaos. He's become just as chaotic as the rest of Japan, which he remonstrated a moment ago. Therefore, I'm interpreting this as a twist, so to speak. Yes, on the surface, Mishima is a right-wing nationalist. But is there a possible reading, I think so, I'm trying to sell it to you, that Mishima's not so crazy after all? 
that he knows this nationalism is a little bit chaotic, that he knows committing seppuku is chaotic, at least in 1960 he did, and he was wrestling with this in 1960. And Takayama isn't the hero that he was painted to be. As a matter of fact, how does the story end? The text doesn't end with his death. As a matter of fact, how else does he die? On page 52, Reiko could bear the sight no longer. She tried to go to her husband's help, but she could not stand. She moved through the blood on her knees, and her white skirts grew deep red. Moving to the rear of her husband, she helped no more than by loosening the collar. She moved the co collar a little bit so that the blade could go through. Oh, I don't even like touching my neck while reading that. But what's interesting about that? She has to help him commit suicide. She has to help him commit seppuku. He can't do it by himself. He's not strong enough to do it by himself. Maybe he's not patriotic enough. Maybe he's not moral enough to do it himself. And that's where I see a paradox. As a matter of fact, to take that paradox a bit further, the last chapter of this story is solely devoted to Reiko's suicide. And so I asked earlier, who's the real hero here? Takayama or Reiko? Well, the story ends with Reiko killing herself. Not with Takayama killing himself. After all, Takayama needed help. And there's a little bit of paradox with Reiko's character at the end, too. On page 48, ever since her marriage, her husband's existence had been her own existence, and every breath of his had been a breath drawn by herself. But now, while her husband's existence in pain was a vivid reality, Reiko could find in this grief of hers no certain proof at all of her own existence. The tragedy of this story is not Takayama losing his existence, but Reiko losing hers, and maybe even not even having her own independent existence at all on page 48. However, a couple pages later, her own chapter. She's devoted, Mishima has devoted a whole chapter to Reiko and Reiko's death. On page 54, this was no longer makeup to please her husband. It was makeup for the world which she would leave behind. She no longer has a husband. Her husband's dead. Now she's put on makeup for the world and she's doing it herself. She's showing her independence, finally, after her husband is dead. And how does she finally meet her end? On page 56, in her husband's agonized face, there had been something inexplicable which she was seeing for the first time. Now she would solve that riddle. Reiko sensed that at last she too would be able to taste the true bitterness and sweetness of that great moral principle in which her husband believed. And there yet again is another paradox, the bitter sweetness of morality. And she finally sees the bitter sweetness of morality. She's presented, that's the first time that we have it articulated in this text, the paradox of morality. After all, we all want to be moral, but isn't it bittersweet to be moral. Well, so Mishima might be suggesting. And how does this text end? Reiko rested the point of the blade against the base of her throat. She thrust hard. The wound was only shallow. Her head blazed and her hands shook uncontrollably. She gave the blade a strong pull sideways. A warm substance flooded into her mouth and everything before her eyes reddened. In a vision of sprouting blood. She gathered her strength and plunged the point of the blade deep into her throat. And so the story ends with Reiko's death.
you know, I was talking all the stuff about with Rico's death. Did she kill herself? Why did she kill herself? Not because she didn't have the courage to do what her nation asked her to do. Like Takayama. The nation called on Takayama to do something. He didn't have the courage to do it. He thought seppuku was the honorable death. She followed, Reiko followed her husband all her life. Now her husband is gone. And for the first time, she takes an independent action. The bittersweet morality of freedom, the bittersweet morality of independence. And of course she kills herself. And that's where the tragedy lies, not with Takayama, who in my estimation is a fool. But rather we see in Reiko the courage of real morality and this pain of real morality, the bitter sweetness of real morality. And by the way, isn't this what Soseki talked about? Now I'm making an intertextual connection. Isn't this the same thing Soseki was talking about when he talked about the agony of freedom and the loneliness of individualism and the difficulty of independence? And here we have Reiko finally acting all these things out with her body in the only way a body can when it doesn't feel respect or love or anything from the outside world when the outside world is so chaotic. And I don't know what to say about that. How do we respond to the chaos? Well, Mishima, the writer, kills himself. So many other people kill themselves too. And my hunch though, is that Mishima sees the paradox of killing herself, killing himself. And he's questioning it all the while. All the while he's questioning it. And isn't that the exact question of life? Why go on living? Why go on living? And it's a tragedy to me that Reiko didn't answer that question in a more positive light. It's a tragedy to me that Mishima didn't answer the question in a positive light. And that's the struggle, isn't it? Trying to find an answer to that question. Why go on living? Maybe we'll find the answer next time. Bye-bye.